It's my immense pleasure to welcome you to our third and final Transformation Literacy Conference session. Uh, we have an incredible lineup of speakers uh, that we'll get to hear from shortly. Uh, as you know, many of you joined us also on Monday when we focused on the transformation enablers of narratives and metrics. Some of you were here also on Wednesday when we were looking very closely at innovations and regulations. Uh, today, our focus will be on uh, governance, so multi-stakeholder governance, and enabling structures that can enhance inclusive democracy and good governance. My colleague Elizabeth Kuhn, just co-director at CLI, will offer an input to frame the day. And then we'll be celebrating and learning from transformation practitioners, partners, funders, and academics. These are our speakers today. And then through a panel, will be facilitated by my colleague, Douglas Williamson, um, we'll discuss entrenched transformation challenges and possible solutions. And finally, what we're trying to do more broadly is help enliven a community for leading transformative change collectively. Uh, in, in doing this, the culture that we're trying to create is a, a culture of care, a culture of respect, so in, in all of our interactions today, we encourage you to embody that kind of respect and also some patience with any technical glitches that we might encounter. Um, please express your views clearly and concisely. And also listen with an attitude of seeking to understand one another. This includes suspending our own uh, judgments and remembering to be open to, to others' perspectives. Uh, I'm moderating today with um, Elizabeth Kuhn and Douglas Williamson. I wonder if they could join me briefly on stage to, to say hello. There we go, there's Elizabeth. Good to have you with us. And Douglas. There he is, great. So Elizabeth calling in from Potsdam, Germany. Douglas is in New York City. I'm on the Spanish Canary Island of La Palma. Uh, so let's, as we, we move into our data together, I would invite Elizabeth to um, give an input momentarily. We want to hear first though from, uh, from you, from participants. And we've prepared a short poll. Um, my colleague um, Martin would kindly um, paste that into the text chat. Uh, a poll that's going to ask you about your country, uh, your sector, and a question about what, what you associate with multi-stakeholder governance and enabling structures for sustainability transformations. So that link is in the text chat. Please click there and complete that now. And momentarily, I'll share the results as they start coming in. All right, I see that a number of you are filling out the poll now. I'm curious to see if we're going to add to the number of countries. We're already at 25. And then we'll see which sectors people are coming from, as well as a response to this question about today's topic. All right, I see some of the responses coming in now. It looks like about a dozen of you are still filling out the poll. Um, and it'll just take another minute to, to complete. As you're doing that, I'll, I'll share my screen here some of the countries coming in now. So it looks like we're just over 30 individuals at the moment. Um, quite a few of us are from Germany, um, as well as Spain. I think that's, that's also partly my wife and sons who are joining us today. 
but also, also other transformation practitioners in Spain. Um, we've got countries across Europe, whether that's the Netherlands, um, yeah, Germany and Spain, across Africa. We're looking especially at South Africa, where CLI has its uh, office in Cape Town. Uh, and Egypt, where we have uh, another associate and lots of activity. The United States is represented there, and we're as far east as Japan. So thanks for thanks for that. I'm curious now to see um, what the sector representation is. There we go. Wow, about two thirds of us, almost exactly two thirds of us, are representing civil society, and then we also have a strong public sector contingent with us today, as well as a couple of people from private sector, academia, and other sectors. So welcome to, to all of you. Um, now here, we're looking at this question of what comes to mind, what do you associate uh, with multi-stakeholder governance and or enabling structures for sustainability transformation? So let's, let's take in some of the language we're seeing here, everything from chaos and creativity and it being challenging to decision-making on equal terms, facilitating leadership, uh, participation, inclusion. Thank you for these inputs here. Equity is listed, co-creation and dialogue. Uh, thanks very kindly. All right. So we're really excited that all of you have chosen to join us today. Um, you're, the work you're doing around the world is truly inspiring. And as an entry point, uh, we're going to focus more on governance and structures with an input from Elizabeth. If she could kindly uh, join me on stage, that would be really welcome uh, for her input on governance and structures. Over to you, Elizabeth. Hey, thank you very much, Dominic. And welcome everyone to uh, yeah to this last session, also from my side of our transformation literacy. Uh, week uh, today about governance and structures. And so governance uh, is also part of our overarching team this uh, theme this week, um, but also one of our um, one of the strategic drivers behind uh, transformation and transformative change. And so um, with that, just sort of setting setting the frame a bit uh, on what this means, this guidance uh, today when we talk about governance and structures, enabling uh, transformation. When we talk about uh, governance in general, I say it's, I mean, it's originally, it's a description of a form of governing, but it's now used more and more also to describe simply different ways of collective decision-making processes. And so um, when we talk about multi-level governance as one of the drivers for transformation, we say it emerges when um, we have different uh, we have basically consultation and collaboration around different issues uh, and on different levels. So what comes to mind is here that we integrate top down and also bottom up processes of, uh, of structured dialogue, of structured engagement, of um, consultations, of collaborations around different levels and, and different topics. And it's also supported if we have um, different cross-sector and also complementary collaboration ecosystems. So let's say we talk about one particular topic. Um, so uh, I would say I think uh, renewable energies is is a really high is a really high issue right now, but we also had uh, in the previous session the topic of public goods, for example. So a lot of times here it's really important to bring together you know local, regional, national, and in even international, um, governance structures and networks um, together in order to really shift things. But you can also have focus on one geographical region and bring different topics together. So last session we had really from Finland talking about how Finland as a as a state really looks and prioritizes particular sustainability issues and particular SDGs and really shifting transformation in the country as such. And finally, we also look at peer reviews and regular learning mechanisms to really make sure that the multi-level governance really targets what, what needs to be done and that in the structure of making decisions, 
we really learn from each other as much as possible. And so integrating this in a structured way is really key because our learning efforts, we know these are all important, but in the day-to-day -day business, they can also um, they can also often fall behind because it's time consuming. So this connects us back uh, to the thread also of our previous sessions where education was already highlighted as a really important and key element also in the other drivers. And it takes a particular role also here when we look at governance. And so when we take this democracy uh, lens, democracy and good governance lens, that is our theme this week, what emerges here is that we really look at our governance initiatives or governance elements in our initiatives that we promote decentralized governance systems. So make sure that power is not focused in one geographical location or in one you know, committee, in one structural element. Making sure that we combine different options for decision-making processes. We have consensus-making um, approaches. As you just mentioned, it's one of the things that comes to your mind also um, when thinking about this topic that came from the from the poll we just had. So consensus, but we also have different voting options, different voting systems. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from um, also governing systems across the world, how that is made. And if you combine different ones in our different initiatives, that has a greater um, element also of balancing things out and fostering a democratic approach. And of course, as a key element, I think that that goes through democratic approaches anywhere, really strengthen civil society wherever that is possible. And so if you look from governance and we shift to structures, structures in general, or what we call enabling structures here, is it's important to remember we're not only talking let's say, for example, about bureaucratic structures, what you mentioned in the poll just now, but we're really thinking about institutional structures, yes, but also legal ones, physical ones, mental structures, our mind structures, our way, how much are we reflecting about things? How much do we really ref like think about systemic structures, structures that influence our thinking as individuals and as collectives? And so enabling structures or so structures that really help transformative efforts, they actually emerge when we make sure or wherever possible, we really embed an approach of transformation stewardship in those structures existing or in those that we are promoting and developing. And that simply means that we have a step-by-step -step clear engagement for collaboration on really concrete topics. And these can overlap and complement and be on different levels and upscale and downscale. So thinking about combining these different collaborations that focus on different kinds of structures and each keep a feasible range. This is the idea behind really having global view about transformation stewardship. So a good example here would be to consider different, let's say, initiatives on infrastructure, technology, regulation, citizen engagement that are all relevant for really transformation or transitions even to like new transformative approaches and transformations that we need. And I think Manuel in particular is going to talk a little bit about this later. That's one part, but we also need to think structures, not just formally, but also informally. And I think that becomes in particular relevant when the formal structures are not, are not necessarily working as they should. Um, so really building networks across existing structures um, that can be networks for change, that can be transformation networks, but also learning networks, communities of practice, as you mentioned, because structure as such is not the challenge here. It's structures that um, that promote negative path dependency. So we've seen that, for example, the structure of a nation state can be really problematic and difficult um, when talking about you know, global or regional issues of sustainability challenges that actually ask us to think beyond the nation state and also make decisions beyond the nation state. And so finally, Third so point also for, for structures, equally important is 
to just take this approach of form follows function. So of course, if there isn't, if there aren't structures there, or if there are structures that are dysfunctional, it's important that we do establish those that we need. So if that's committees or councils or any other kind of coordination structures, that's super important. As long as it really remains flexible and is, is focused really on also results delivery here. And so if we take here, also the democracy and governance lens, it's important to say, whenever we have structures, remember to strengthen those that are decentralized. So that takes also, that connects to what I just mentioned on governance as well. Decentralization, support different kind of networks, especially around dysfunctional structures that exist. And also to remind ourselves and remember together that there are different entry points because we have different kind of structures. So mental, institutional, legal, and physical ones. And to see which ones are open to our, uh, to our input, which are, which ones are open to our change? Where can we shift things? Is it just one or is it several that we can connect to? And so structures and governance, I think are one of the are two enablers that are most intuitively connected, I would say. If we take, for example, networks, they are as a form, they're both a structure, but also a way of organizing exchange and collaboration. And I think especially today, uh, in, like the last couple of years, networks, exchange networks, communities of practice are becoming ever more important in this search for solutions to these global challenges that we have, but global challenges manifest locally. And so... Networks are really emerging as a key thing here. And structures influence the governance processes that we have and vice versa. It's really a very interdependent uh, connection that we have here. And if we're looking at diversity of governance systems, so diversity of making decisions and coming to decisions, such a diversity also paves the way for us to find a diversity of structures and a functioning structures for us to bring forward transformation. And so I leave it there because it's a large topic, but I think what we're really looking forward to is now to hear our practitioners, our case from, from um, advancing really um, good structures, enabling structures and, and governance insights. And so I hand it back with this to Dominic. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, for that framing input. I see some applause coming in and would encourage all participants to use the emojis at the bottom of their screen when they agree with a point that a speaker is making. Um, there's a thumbs up, there's a heart down there, there are moments for celebration. So feel free to use those. And indeed, uh, Elizabeth is right. We have a really inspiring range of speakers uh, with us today. Um, all the way from the United States, we have David Manuel Navarrete and Bruce Goldstein. Uh, I'll be introducing them in a moment when they present first. Um, we'll move on to Manuel Rojas uh, in Germany, as well as Dr. Anke Giesen, uh, both of whom are in Berlin. And finally, we'll get to hear from Mariana Zaviska uh, in Ukraine. Uh, something that's unique about today's presenters um, is that we'll get to go into some depth. So um, first, David and Bruce are going to offer us a broader context, a look at transformation practitioners, um, which I believe we all are in a conference like this. And with that context set, we'll get to go into some interrelated key topics, some very actual current topics. Um, in Germany, Russia, and Ukraine uh, will be the focus. And so after each speaker, there's a very brief opportunity for clarifying questions and a panel will follow that will allow uh, all the participants to identify and prioritize a top challenge and a top solution that they've heard today or that, that you feel uh, needs to be highlighted. And that challenge uh, and that solution, those will be put uh, by, by my colleague Douglas to the panelists uh, to discuss in more depth. So my apologies in advance if I have to move us along um, in a very deliberate way. I want to respect the fact that each speaker has 
his or her chance to make their input and make sure that we can get to the panel um, in, in an efficient way. So the, as, as Martin is pointing out in the text chat, um, please put your questions for speakers into the Q&A. So the Q&A is a specific feature at the bottom of your screen. There's an icon there um, with speech bubbles, it says Q&A. So please indicate um, your question. You can, you can direct your question to any of, any of the speakers and they'll be able to respond verbally to one or two questions. And then the speakers are invited to respond in writing using the same Q and A icon uh, to questions that we couldn't take in plenary. So please record your questions there, not in the text chat. All right. Let's jump in here um, with Bruce and David. Bruce Goldstein is at the University of Colorado uh, in Boulder in the United States where he's associate professor uh, in the program on environmental design. And along with David, he'll be presenting on transformation practitioners from personal to systems aliveness. Um, David Manuel Navarrete is associate professor in sustainability at Arizona State University. So the two are not exactly neighbors, but are going are working very closely in their research and their practice. Um, both are involved in the transformations community uh, in many uh, diverse and, and profound ways. So David and Bruce, I'd like to invite you to the stage and I'd be happy to share, share slides here uh, for you. I thought giving the mic over to the two of you and we'll, we'll jump right in. 10 minutes, please. Okay, I'll start. Hi, everyone. Uh, greetings from Boulder, Colorado. So. We have a global community of transformations practitioners. We've been doing conferences for the last 10 years. Uh, you can Google it under transformations community. We have an exciting range of conferences this year in Prague and Sydney and Portland, Maine and online. And we wondered a couple of years ago, who the heck are transformations practitioners anyway? Who are these people who keep showing up to our conferences? So this, uh, <laughs> Davina and I are going to share with you uh, the result of uh, some research we did. We interviewed 60 of the folks who attended our conferences and call themselves transformations practitioners. And uh, in order to get an understanding of what is a transformations practitioner. So, uh, David, take it away, and then I'll jump back in, and then he'll finish up. So the first thing that we found is that uh, in order to become a transformation practitioner, uh, most of, in most cases, it was a personal process. It wasn't something that you are trained on or something that uh, you gain through formal education. And uh, in this process, uh, there was like a pattern that we found and it's uh, first a moment of crisis and it can be a turning point, it can be a progressive set of uh, epiphanies. And in that in that crisis, there is a, a rejection of the status quo, the, the, the realization that there is something fundamentally wrong with how things are. And there are also disorienting experiences that helps to, to question uh, the, the, the status quo. And then the other element in this crisis is that there is a, uh, we found, and this is something that we weren't expecting, in many cases, uh, this comes from being exposed to non-Western and non-expert, non-scientific uh, knowledges in very deep ways. Then from that crisis, there is an integration. There is a process of integration that means that uh, this personal process needs to be integrated into the professional activities and range of uh, practices that one normally does, and as well as a process of reconnection, finding people and places where there is a deep care about uh, the natural world. Bruce? Yeah, the next question we looked at is what what do people think about when they say transformations? What is transformative change? So what we found is these practitioners didn't see it the same way that that academics and theorists uh, propose transformation to be defined. They talked about it as not only a way to understand change, uh, but as a way to appreciate the difficulty of bringing change about. And that it had not only the complexity lens and the different dimensions, temporal, spatial, and whatnot, but it also had a strong subjective component. Um, so it's not only a way of knowing, but a process and a way of being, according to uh, a lot of these practitioners, not just a theory. Uh, it's about engaged and embodied work that's grounded in our own ability to undergo personal change, which we found fascinating. So being a transformation practitioner requires being willing to transform ourselves and undergoing that change. 
So it's 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 a powerful sphere of personal and collective action, and it requires engaging not only with your own conflicts and, and change processes, but also multiple ways of knowing in the world and power relations that sustain those ways of knowing. Um, so, uh, yeah. So who are we is the next question uh, and the next slide of uh, as, pra- as transformations practitioners. Like, okay, if that's how they thought about transformation, how do they think about themselves as practitioners? What we found is a lot of these folks framed their work as boundary spanning and boundary crossing. So not not pure researchers, not pure practitioners, but reflective professionals and action researchers who engage in action and experimentation and learning. This kind of adaptive learning cycle was really key to how they described their practice. And often it wasn't it wasn't esoteric or distanced. It was about being in full partnership with communities. So uh, it was about combining all the roles that we talk about when we think about engaged um, communities and organizations, like what, what Elizabeth was describing earlier. So designer, organizer, facilitator, mediator, uh, expert, policy advocate, all these kinds of uh, uh, roles. Fundamentally, we found three practices at the heart of being a transformations practitioner. The first is the participatory <laughs> diagnosis. And that's about kind of framing the systems change challenge through dialogue with stakeholders and communities. So that participatory diagnosis of the problem. The second thing we found was expertise and knowledge co-production. So it was about co-producing knowledge with experts and communities to develop knowledge and awareness about the prospects for change. So not just esoteric knowledge, but really engaged community-based knowledge. The third thing people described was their focus on collective action. So it's about anticipating conflict and resistance and probing for opportunities to build coalitions. That's what they described as as the core of Kant Transformation's practice. So the places they did this kind of work were often what we ended up terming transformations catalysts, kind of organizations, just like Elizabeth described, where you could do work that was exploratory, creative, at multiple scales, cross-scalar, that would support dialogue and reflection. So creating safe spaces where people could learn together, imagine and develop and inhabit better worlds, and then develop that collective capacity to act. So back over to you, David. (laughs) So in terms of skills, um, we found that the soft skills were very important. Reciprocity, humility, self-reflection, embracing discomfort, as well as things that we normally don't consider as skills, like uh, Co- compassion and and learning and learning was very important we we are very good at learning and adding up uh, new knowledge but uh, for, to be transformative you have to sometimes uh, unlearn right <laughs> what you know because otherwise you can the new the new no, the new learning cannot happen next slide please and then uh Challenges. These are very important, I think, for this session, right? Uh, because one of the main challenges were within the institutions in which these practitioners uh, were uh, um, working or, or operating. Many of them were uh, uh, academics that uh, uh, try to uh, get out of of the ivory tower uh, type of culture, and uh, they were they were encountering a lot of rigidities. And the idea, one idea, is that the institutions sometimes are set up to maintain the status quo. That's the way it's uh, essential for their own survival. So institutions don't like transformations in a sense. And the incentive structures are key there, right? Uh, is, uh, is the key entry point to uh, start changing uh, the way institutions o- operate. But what they found, uh, what we found also is that uh, usually transformations work is in addition to all the other uh, o- obligations and uh, um, you know that one has within the institutions institutions don't promote that and that leads to burnout because uh, in addition to all the work that you are supposed to do you engage also on on this transformations work and uh, i guess I'll, I'll pass it to you bruce to end yeah just last slide just a quick question we're really curious 
do you do you do you see yourselves in this lens that we saw um, as terms of what is a transformations practitioner? And more importantly, if we're if we're living in these challenges, if we have these frustrations, this isolation, struggling against the institutions in which we're embedded, how can collaborative associations like this one, the emerging TLC community, the transformations community, other kinds of networks and associations of transformations practitioners enable us to be more effective and give us a home where we can feel uh, a connection to one another and build our own sense of, of agency and capacity. That's all we got. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to to David and Bruce for for this kickoff presentation for this culminating session of our our conference. Um, I really appreciate that you both started at this personal level where there's there's a deep sense of care that comes through and even this personal level shift that might occur for many of us in, in entering into becoming transformations practitioners. Um, it's embodied work. You talked about transforming ourselves in order to be able to bring that kind of transformation into other places. Uh, I really like the, the idea of transformative spaces. How do we create those where, where practitioners like ourselves can feel at home, can feel a sense of belonging, uh, maybe that's linked to these collaborative associations, Bruce, that you were you were asking about at the end. And and David, your point about institutions not liking transformation, uh, you know, with our focus today on structure as well, I wonder how we could build structures that can can enhance transformation as well. Would be an open question. Uh, so for our participants, um, questions, uh, please, in the Q and A. Um, also to Bruce and David's question, feel free to type any responses in the text chat or just message them, them directly. Um, I have one question that we can take here in, in plenary. It looks like David's already responding, but we can do this one verbally. Um, and David, feel free to jump in. Have you engaged? Oh, uh, and it's already been answered. Have you engaged with the Transformational Change Learning Partnership? And maybe just expand a little bit more generally also beyond that particular partnership. You know, which, which communities are you a part of? Uh, please. Yeah, Bruce can can answer about the, the communities we are part of. I mean, we are engaging now. So <laughs> that was my uh, my short answer. Yeah. That's our first engagement formally. Although I have been, you know, individually at an individual level, you know, engaged in this in this in this community. Bruce? Yeah, uh, David was part of a really interesting partnership uh, that was uh, part of an international network of, of transformative learning labs. Uh, David, maybe you can comment about that. Yeah, that was a, a project that uh, was funded by, um, you know, uh, it, it was a large grant and it, it, we had different T-Labs, we call it, in, in different parts of the, of the world, Africa, Asia. And the, we, we were concerned about methods to actually engage people so that people engage at, at that personal level and then create the collective agency. We thought that uh, collective agency was the key a key element for transformation and that uh, this requires uh, a, a type of exchange that usually you don't get in, in conventional workshops that are outcome oriented. So these were process oriented outcome, uh, uh, process oriented uh, workshop that we call T-Labs, Transformation Labs. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah, much. really cool. Yeah, the transformations community is an attempt to 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 is is engaged in going beyond offering a series of conferences, which have been great events, but we realized that we need the continuity between. And so this research that we just described was an effort to identify what are the core needs of transformations practitioners that we could help meet as a community and respond mm -hmm. to. And what it came down to was, some, I think, something that really resonates with, with, with Dominique and, and Douglas and Elizabeth is, is the idea of supporting effective uh, transformative initiatives and in organizations like networks, communities to practice. How how is that work supported? Because that seems to be a, a like a leverage point for change. If we can develop and sustain effective transformative communities that enable practitioners to be more effective and bring more people into the field, we feel that would really uh, scale up and and uh, the capacity for transformations across a variety of fields. So that's what we're really interested in doing in partnership with CLI. Sure. 
Um, thanks very much, Bruce and David. I would uh, first a round of applause for your input and encourage you to continue to engage in the Q&A and the text chat. I noticed that way some from Egypt is uh, writing in both places, so it'd be great if you could respond. Um, we are, in fact, going to look at some of those communities through our next speakers and look at some of that, what, David, you called <clears throat> collective agency. Um, so let me let me invite our next speaker to the stage. Um, this is Manuel Rojas. Uh, if you could kindly come and join me. Um, Manuel Rojas is chief of staff and policy advisor at the, the German Bundestag uh, or German parliament. And here he comes now, welcome. Uh, and Manuel's input is going to be the first in three inputs that look at you know, Germany, Russia, Ukrainian relationships from different perspectives. So as you listen, we're going to go into some depth in, in this area today, and we're very excited by that, by that process. Um, Manuel, it's an amazing pleasure to have you here. Um, your engagement with CLI spans about a nearly a decade, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so very nice to have you with us and I'll, I'll share your slides for you as we move through. Um, 10 minutes, please, for your input. Yes, so uh, good afternoon, everyone from Berlin. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be uh, back here and to uh, be able to share some thoughts and some insights of uh, a story that is actually moving local communities, environmental groups, and uh, some other people uh, right now. So uh, next slide, please. Um, it is something that um, starts with a problem that probably we all have uh, heard extensively in the last month and uh, during the last year, and that is uh, Russia started an illegal war in Ukraine in 2022, and for Germany, this meant um, some, some very significant changes when it comes to um, energy supply and, and it posed a, a very, very um, big challenge. When it comes to, on the one hand, guaranteeing um, the energy security for its citizens and um, for its economy, uh, especially, I have in mind, it's a very industrial economy. And on the other hand, to reduce uh, carbon emissions to achieve uh, climate neutrality um, before 2024. Um, it looks like it's more and more needed. So uh, have in mind that Germany needs to do this uh, while still being heavily dependent on fossil fuel energy imports, especially from Russia, um, especially gas, but also coal and oil. Um, next slide, please. So <clears throat> to address this issue, uh, the German parliament passed um, in May 2024, uh, 2022, um, the LNG Acceleration Act, which aims to reduce um, the dependency, or this dependency on uh, Russian gas, especially by enabling uh, the swift construction of liquefied natural gas um, import infrastructure and this, you can see actually on the picture how, how this kind of infrastructure actually can look like. So ships that um, come and bring some liquefied gas that needs to be reprocessed. I'm not going into details there, but uh, I can already tell you that uh, most of these techniques are, um, that are, well, the technologies that are used uh, can have negative impacts on the environment. So is it really a solution? Um, that is sustainable, you may ask. Next slide, please. So, um, on short term, for sure, it's a, it's, um, it's a solution to uh, enable um, short term energy security. Uh, and for this, you need to build this like LNG infrastructure. Um, the midterm and long-term perspective there is to say, well, we're building up some fossil uh, fossil fuel um, or fossil-based infrastructure, so we need to give it a sustainable um, user perspective. And for this, um, it's planned that at least parts of this infrastructure is um, or should be used uh, for the later use of hydrogen, especially green hydrogen. Uh, 
And if you're wondering what is green hydrogen and uh, what is all this technology about, um, this may be already part of the problem because it's uh, also very emerging technology. So um, there are still a lot of open questions. So also, let's say uh, with this solution outlook, um, let's put a question mark there because, um, or maybe you can also see there another part why this is already part of, or maybe part of the problem. Next slide, please. So let's uh, let's come to our, our present case, uh, the LNG project on the island of uh, Rügel. So currently, the government already constructed some LNG terminals on the on the northern German coast, and they want to build now a fifth terminal. Um, and this terminal should be on on this island. Um, however, also in contrast to the previous projects, which have been built mainly in industrial areas, um, it's a bit different on Rügen. So right now we have ongoing protests by local communities, by environmental groups who are opposing uh, the building of an industrial and maritime industrial infrastructure um, near the shores of a, well, more and more also nature, sustainable tourist um, resort. Uh, in a protected bird uh, reserve and near a, a larger maritime wild reserve. So you may already uh, feel there are some tensions when it comes to environmental protections um, when you build up an LNG infrastructure or so fossil fuel gas infrastructure um, near a coast. So what what are the what are the what have been like critics where where have been the what have been the reasons for the criticism? So, uh, local communities and the environment groups especially criticize their lack of transparency and uh, citizen participation in the decision making process. In addition, and this is also something that you need to have in mind because um, Rügen is part of the former uh, German Democratic Republic, so. Um, there are some some differences and also some sensitivities and some sensitivities of many people who uh, need to be taken into account, especially when it comes to communication, when it comes to be empathic for the life situations of the people there on the ground. And uh, so there is a lot of tension right now going on there due to this um, due to this plans of the government. And unfortunately, we have also some right wing uh, populist forces groups that I try to misuse this process, uh, the, uh, this protest, um, well, for the upcoming, probably for the upcoming elections in 2024. And I can only say the atmosphere um, right now on the island of Rügen is, is tense, um, also because the decision, um, the final decision by the federal government is expected in the next few weeks. So, this raises some questions. Uh, next slide, please. And this question, this question is really also built a little, on, a little bit on what Elizabeth had uh, originally lined out in 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 her presentation about uh, structures and governments. So, how can you actually, how can you actually um, involve? How can you uh, build a representative dialogue with the local communities, with the stakeholders there? How can you align at the same time your political decisions with uh, environmental and climate protection while coming back to the beginning, um, still being pretty dependent on fossil fuel, um, on a fossil fuel economy and fossil fuel energy resources? So, um, that's not easy. I, I left you with a picture there. Um, it's a picture of Rügen um, and also quite close to the place where um, the terminal is planned to maybe give you a, a better feeling <laughs> on, on also why, may, why people may protest. I'm really curious to learn more about how, what is your perspective on this topic? Um, what are your experience maybe um, on, in your communities with similar infrastructure programs? Um, I heard also from uh, someone, um, someone uh, being right now in the U.S. who um, shared 
um, that also there in the US, a local a lot of protests going on due to LNG infrastructure pro uh, processes. So also there, we're speaking about the problem where you can see probably um, it's not only unique here in Germany or unique in, in Rügen. Maybe we have to deal or we have to deal with these questions um, in different parts of the world. So I'm really curious to um, looking forward to your insights, to your ideas and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. All right, thank, thank you so much, Manuel, for this input, also from your perspective as a policy advisor. And it occurs to me when you're talking that um, these, like what is politically palatable for, for the, the citizens in Germany, seems like there's, there's compromise that you're talking about between uh, sort of societal outcomes, environmental outcomes, political outcomes. And then this, this dynamic that you touch on of uh, strong local citizen voices um, in the context of international dynamics between Russia, Germany, Ukraine, and, and beyond, as you point out. Um, it seems like there are no single, single solutions, um, but rather processes. And I think you pointed out to me earlier that um, the, the, the German government has decided to shorten citizen consultation processes in order to be more expedient um, and to be able to react quicker to, to some of this. So maybe that's something you could, you could comment on is consultation on the one hand versus expediency or efficiency on the other. Um, and in the meantime, I welcome uh, questions, um, but perhaps comment on that last one for myself, if you would. Yes, uh, so thank you so much. Um, with this LNG Acceleration Act, uh, it enables the government to uh, reduce the legal periods um, that you would usually have with this kind of construction projects um, for citizens to comment, um, to object to this kind of um, projects, but also to demand, for instance, public hearing and to, to get into dialogue with policymakers with the idea um, to, uh, in, to well increase the speed um, and to reduce, let's say, all this like procedures that can take cut time in a moment where you want to um, create energy security as fast as possible. And the same goes for environmental uh, protection um, rules that also are being, mm, well, um, let's say they're cre they create exceptional rules uh, so that they're not um, applied in its fullest uh, when it comes to this kind of projects. So to make it short, um, this law means less citizen participation, less citizen consultation, and less environmental protection in order to maintain or to ensure energy security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, those, those are some pretty hard trade-offs um, for, for politicians to negotiate, all, all in the context of eventually wanting to get re-elected in somehow, in some, some way, that's, that's uh, additional pressures there. Um, I don't see anything further in the Q&A just now, um, but if you do have a question for Manuel, I encourage you to type it there. Um, and you have a couple of comments coming in into the text chat, um, but please do stay for the panel when, like you said, we can go more into some of these challenges and to, to some of the solutions, hopefully, that, that participants are identifying. All right, thank you. Another round of applause for Manuel, please. Um, thanks for your input. Uh, so it's now um, my immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Anke Giesen to the stage. Um, my, my colleague, um, Martin Fielko, first met Anke uh, three years ago, I believe, um, when there was participation at um, the, the EU Russian Civil Society Forum. And uh, Anka is with us today from Memorial Germany and Memorial International um, as a director and member of the board in those organizations. And she's promoting civil society in repressive contexts where sometimes these organizations are being undercut um, and by, by repressive regimes. And so let me offer, a, let me share my screen here briefly. Um, it's, should point out that uh, Memorial, in, I think it was in 2022, was the recipient of a Nobel Peace Prize for the work that they do. So it's a special honor, uh, Dr. Anka Giesen, to welcome you here 
Um, also in that context, um, as I mentioned, board member of Memorial International and Memorial uh, Germany. And Anka will be talking to us um, on civil society structures and governance in the context of repressive, repressive regimes. So we can go deeper into this Germany, Russia, you, also Ukraine relationship, um, if you would, uh, Anka. Um, I believe you want to share your own slides. So yeah. I'll stop my sharing and the, the floor is, is over to you, please. Welcome. If you could kindly click on the presentation mode in the bottom right of your screen. Oh, okay. there. there we go. Great. Ten minutes, please. Hello. I'm very pleased to share my experiences in our memorial network here on this conference. Um, as Dominic already said, our network uh, was forced to undergo a transformation due to uh, the um, you juridical liquidation uh, in last year in uh, March. And uh, I would like to speak about my experiences, um, how you can work further on, continue work, uh, although uh, your umbrella organization was forbidden in the country where most of your member organizations are um, yeah, work. Um, uh, and first, I, I want to uh, say some uh, words about Memorial. Uh, maybe not all of you know this organization. Memorial uh, aim is to promote major civil society and democracy based on the rule of law, and thus to prevent a returning to totalitarianism in the countries of former Soviet influence. Uh, that means that um, you, you may have you heard about Stalinism and um, in and uh, Stalinism was not only in the countries of the former USSR, but uh, for example in Eastern Germany we had a Stalinist phase too, and we suffer from it until now. Um, and um, so we have a German branch too. Um, Memorial to also assists formation of public consciousness based on the values of democracy and law and to get rid of totalitarian patterns and to establish firmly human rights in practical politics and in public life. Uh, these are aims which are mostly in the countries of former uh, Soviet um, space. Uh, not so much in the countries which are now belong to uh, the European community, but um, we, in this way, we support the organizations in the Soviet space. Uh, we also work on promoting the revelation of the truth about the historical past and perpetuate the memory of the victims of political repression exercised by totalitarian regimes. Uh, until 1990, um, the archives uh, were closed concerning Stalinists, um, the Stalinist regime and um, the crime it did commit. And so Memorial began to reveal these crimes from beginning of, uh, from the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. Um, so we uh, built an electronic database of the victims and the perpetrators of political terror in the USSR. We organized assistance, both legal and financial, for the former and current victims of political repressions. We conduct research into the historic history of political repression and publicizes books, articles, exhibitions. And we organize conferences, seminars, summer schools, expeditions, and city walks to inform people on the history of political repression in the post-Soviet space and the countries of Soviet influence. Um, Memorial, the first, um, um, the first initiatives to found Memorial was in August uh, 1987 in the perestroika years when Gorbachev uh, abolished censorship, and but it was uh, offic officially founded in 1989, 
um, there was the founding conference of the All Union Voluntary History and Education Society Memorial. In 2020, we had about 60 groups in Russia, six in Ukraine, one in Czech Republic, Republic one in Germany, one in Italy, one in Belgium, and one in France. And in December 20, uh, 2022, uh, we were one of three winners of the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, but now we face many challenges, and these challenges uh, began uh, already in November 2012, when in Russia the uh, foreign agent law was um, adopted. And that means that P that organizations who get money from found foundations from abroad, um, uh, they um, they get the label foreign agent, and that means in the uh, in the Soviet con in the Russian Soviet context that you are a spy, and it's a kind of a heavy stigmatization. Um, so then first members and activists of Memorial in Russia was legally prosecuted um, on the base of counterfeit exhibits. And um, in at the end, in December of 2021, um, the umbrella organization, the international umbrella organization was officially liquidated by court. And the member organization too, the... Um, um, public Rights Center uh, Memorial. In February, then started the war of aggression against Ukraine, and in February uh, 2022, and we had the adoption of numerous censorship laws, and that means that many activists of Memorial in Russia who had um, had written articles about um, about the um, Articles uh, about Stalinist repression, they fell under the censorship law and had to go abroad. The judgment of liquidation was then finished, uh, confirm confirmated in March. What can you do in such a situation? And I can recommend just continue working. We as a board, the international board, we ignored just um, the court decision and um, continued working as, uh, as an organization, as a board. Um, very um, important is to have high commitment to organizational goals and beliefs to, um, that you can remain um, working under the stress. Um, we had the luck uh, to have an organization in reserve. There was a Russian umbrella organization which was not very um, which was not in the focus of the um, authorities. So the work of the international organization went to the Russian umbrella organization. We went over to encrypted communication and uh, we had highly collective decision processes so that every point of view could be um, was um, um, I don't know the word now. Um, we helped activists who wanted to go into exiles. We were tolerant for people who said, this is too dangerous for me. I will leave the work. And uh, we were not too surprised about conflicts between the staying people and the ones who were leaving into exile. Um, very important was that we had a high understanding, compassion, and support for activists um, from which were in safe countries in relation to those in unsafe political situation. Um, our prospects now, and after more than a year of highly stress, is that we there will be a foundation of a new international umbrella organization in May 20, uh, 2023 in Geneva. Three new organizations by exiled exit. Ex activists were already founded, and we are entering into new cooperation with organizations from non-Russian countries. So um, 
I think the transformation from an organization with was uh, based more in Russia to an organization which um, acts more on the international level with an uh, with a focus in uh, Western Europe um, is yes we uh, we managed to do this. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you, Dr. Dr. Anke Giesen, for, for this contribution to our conference today and, and all the work that Memorial's been doing over the last decades. Um, what stands out to me are the powerful narratives with, with which you're working, so democracy versus totalitarianism. Um, stand, you're standing up for individuals who have undergone significant trauma. Um, so going from this, this, the global narratives also very much to the individual level and keeping things current through ongoing education. That must be an enormous task just to keep, keep the past present um, with all of us today. Um, <clears throat> I was really moved by the what to do slide. I saw around engagement, you know, continuing to do the work, continuing to remain committed, but around humanity being, being empathetic with those, those who say, this is too much for me, this is too dangerous. Um, but also the innovation piece, and, and the encrypted communications, you know, trying to figure out ways to work around um, perceived blockages, you know, uh, in the system. Uh, so, Anka, let's see if we have any, uh, we don't have any questions coming in uh, just yet. Uh, people might be taking in your, your input. Um, I'm noticing from uh, Douglas in the text chat, I feel the network power of Memorial as a structure and a form, as Elizabeth was mentioning in the intro. Um, it sounds like a structure that was, as you said at the beginning, also able to transform itself. When you have a, an organization in reserve, that's, that's quite smart. <laughs> um, and then new organizations coming, it almost sounds like a movement on that last slide where you said there are more, more coming. So any comments you might have on uh, around structure, also around the decision making. You mentioned collective decision making, where all voices were 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 heard, or what what you see as coming next. Was this a question? Or yeah. well, <laughs> let's let's imagine let's imagine that your slide had one more one more uh, your presentation had one more slide. Um, what are the future prospects? You know, you say, so you have some changes happening now, but what do you see coming in in the next year or two? Yes, um, that the focus of our umbrella organization will be in Europe and that will, we will work uh, from Europe and coordinate the network and the organizations who are still um, working in Russia, there are some, and the organization who are working in Ukraine, they are also under a great pressure. For example, uh, the members of our organization in Odessa, they are now uh, soldiers at the front. And um, we have to work with this tendons too. And, um, but I think um, uh, we, our members and our activists, they are so highly um, they, they familiar with repression in the past and in the in the um, in the present times, um, mm -hmm. and so committed to the goals and beliefs of the organization that um, it will be a, we will be able to support those people who are um, working. Uh, continue working in in highly uh, insecure situations, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, I hope that they will um, be able to live with that stress. Mm -hmm. Well, this to me links back also to what we heard from Bruce and David, uh, also about a challenge of of burnout among transformations practitioners, as they were they were calling them. Um, and my sincere hope for you and your colleagues is that you can avoid that kind of burnout. This is clearly emotionally taxing yeah. work as well. And that maybe there's a way to to rotate the membership and the, the employees of these uh, the different yeah. 
memorial organization. And there is a program uh, for those who are continuing working in Russia that they can get until 10 or 12 weeks uh, mm. to, to a country from European uh, community and uh, have a um, vacation there and um, um, that they don't undergo this stress the whole time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another round of applause for Dr. Anke Giesen. Thank you for contributing to our conference. And we'll have a chance uh, in the panel uh, to go more into challenges and to, to solutions that, that participants are, are seeing. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to welcome Mariana Zaviska to the stage. Mariana is a member of the CLI family. She's an independent facilitator and consultant uh, in Ukraine. And we've had a chance uh, to work with her over many years, um, especially here in the conference, my colleague Douglas, um, with a focus on the healthcare sector in Ukraine um, and also on internally displaced persons uh, in Ukraine. Um, today, Mariana is with us to talk about collaboration across societal levels for democracy and good governance in Ukraine. And Mariana, as you wish, feel free to integrate things that you've heard from all the, the foregoing speakers um, as, as appropriate. I understand that you would like to share your own slides, so I'll stop sharing there. The floor is yours, Mariana. Yeah, thank you, Dominic, for the introduction. And uh, also thank you, all colleagues who are speaking today. Um, I would love to integrate some of the ideas, but I think that uh, this 10 minutes will be really not enough even to react and to compliment uh, everyone in this um, session today. Uh, probably I will start my input with uh, a very broad introduction uh, where Ukrainian society is standing right now. So, um, and, and to frame a little bit how um, democracy, good governance and um, multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral collaboration is essential right now. Uh, so um, at the beginning, I want to underline that we uh, here in Ukraine are facing at least three um, major tasks as society. First of all, um, yeah, staying alive and resisting the Russian invasion, literally, but also um, getting engaged into uh, all different kinds of um, um, security issues in Ukraine. Also, what uh, Dr. Anke mentioned, um, many people, and as well as um, regular citizens, but also representatives of different uh, institutions are fighting at the front line that affects um, the whole structure and approaches um, with which we are working. But also uh, many of, uh, of representatives of, of the communities are engaged into uh, different kinds of activities related to creating new supply chains for the army, training uh, military people, training uh, civilians to go through this um, through this period of history. Uh, also, the society is largely engaged in responding to the humanitarian crisis, so working with internally displaced people, families of uh, war veterans, war veterans who are coming back to the communities, uh, but also supporting those who are affected, directly affected uh, by the war, who have um, damaged or destroyed uh, homes, who need, uh, who lost their works, and so on. And finally, um, and what is uh, mostly exciting, but also challenging, uh, we need to work on transforming the society and transforming the country, uh, modernizing Ukraine and uh, getting ready to uh, EU integration and, and uh, for the democratization of Ukraine. So uh, this, this preconditions require a lot of um, inclusiveness in structures. They require a lot of new structures, which are participatory, which uh, can embrace different representatives and different stakeholders in the country, uh, structures which can proceed uh, inputs uh, and respond to the needs of all the different groups in the society which existed before uh, February 24, 2022, and those groups which are emerging right now because of the war and the changes in the country. 
Um, yeah, the first thing that uh, is going on um, probably since 2014, but is more important during the last year is that um, the real power, real strength uh, lies in the civil society, which has a knowledge expertise network to address all the challenging issues inside Ukraine. And uh, the civil society is, uh, from one hand, is treated as a real partner of the government, of local authorities in um, addressing all these challenges that we are facing as a society, but also uh, having this uh, strong civil society here in Ukraine um, is kind of a challenge, especially uh, to different actors who are entering Ukraine uh, from outside for different international organizations. So um, Ukrainian civil society citizens want to be engaged into all processes and that is coming into a certain conflict with existing procedures, bureaucracy of all these uh, international institutions that are operating right now in Ukraine. And here in the picture, you can see um, one of the self-organized volunteer groups, which uh, emerged in actually the first day of the invasion, and they were operating during um, the whole 14 months, first half of the year as a volunteer group doing evacuation in Kiev region, then in uh, Donetsk region. And finally, they um, institutionalized and created a charity organization, which is um, now operating on a more formal level and is participating in a different kind of structures regarding um, support to internal displaced people and war veterans. So what we've uh, also seen in terms of um, the role of civil society right now, um, uh, I must admit that self-organization is a key driver. That is something very essential for Ukrainian spirit and that uh, was here uh, since the um, independence of Ukraine, but it's really a very important thing um, during last year. And if uh, and also um, in the society, the the image of the civil uh, society of Ukraine uh, has changed. So not only NGOs and charities, which are formally established, are treated as uh, a civil society actor, but all this different kind of um, institutions or groups which are um, NGOs, local communities, condominiums, um, youth centers, uh, small, medium-sized entrepreneurs, uh, different media and uh, watchdog groups uh, who are now working in Ukraine. Uh, so in the picture, you can see um, how community members in previously occupied village in Kiev region self-organize um, and are building um, a house of a family member uh, of, of the community member they are operating under an umbrella, a network organization, which is called um, Building Ukraine Together, which is very decentralized, um, horizontal uh, structure uh, where everyone all over Ukraine can initiate uh, this uh, process of rebuilding um, homes, rebuilding um, damaged or destroyed homes. And this uh, structure can support some organizational uh, administrative uh, things behind this uh, uh, behind this work. Uh, also, even in this um, situation of the constant threat uh, and um, yeah, constant challenges related to security, uh, there are already a lot of um, topics or areas where civil society has strong impact during this fourteen months, uh, and where a strong commitment for collective action is uh, is felt, it's visible. So it's really reintegrate among the topics there are that reintegration of war veterans uh, to the local communities, um, creating community-based solutions for internal displaced persons to get integrated uh, to host communities, promoting access to education and creating a lot of alternative ways for uh, Ukrainian children to get education during um, the, the insecure situation. Advocating for gender in equality and inclusion. Uh, that's a very important point because uh, there are two processes which were uh, very or are kind of successful during last year. So the advocation or advocacy for ratification of the Istanbul Convention in Ukraine last year, 
and um, a huge process that is going on right now, the advocation for LGBTQ uh, marriages in Ukraine, uh, which is led um, by a lot of people who are serving in army and uh, are trying to um, yeah, to preserve their rights for uh, marriage, for partnerships, and also for access to uh, yeah to different civilian rights, and also advocating for green recovery of Ukraine that is approaching and that is happening right now. So to uh, consider the interests not only for uh, of government of citizens of local communities, but also consider interests of the nature and other species. Um, which are part of, of Ukraine as a country. So what is uh, also in terms of existing structures? I want to share some, some figures. So you see that um, more than half of Ukrainians are committed uh, to take decisions about the future of Ukraine. So a little bit less think that local authorities should determine the future of Ukraine, but also one figure that is not on the slides but um, came up today in a fresh research that uh, also 72 percent of ukrainians won't take won't uh, take part won't take action in the rebuilding of you of their communities so that's uh, something that really requires uh, some organizations some structures but also um, this energy this willingness and commitments um, can be or and are already integrated uh, into the existing structures on different level levels. So here you can see this different ways how civil society can participate in um, processes of democratization, decision making in Ukraine. Uh, on international level, uh, civil society took uh, leadership and um, developed and promoted the civil society Lugano Declaration, underlying principles for recovery of Ukraine. On national level, there are also um, a number of working groups and structured conversations that um, are built uh, around the reco National Recovery Plan of Ukraine, which is something like a new social societal agreement um, inside the society, how the uh, recovery should be uh, implemented uh, and what are the underlying principles. But also on the local level, uh, there are local governance structures uh, which engage local community members to um, different local decision making. These are uh, local um, civic councils, uh, youth councils, uh, informal groups, uh, and also NGOs at the local level who take care uh, that the interests of um, people who are affected by the war and local communities are uh, properly represented. Um, I will wrap up with uh, challenges and with questions. Uh, so definitely one of the challenges uh, was, as I mentioned in the beginning, was this uh, well-developed civil society, which has a lot of different groups who are organized or semi-organized. So the challenge is how to develop a shared vision and how to build dialogue in that way that all the interests can be uh, balanced and embraced. How to maintain inclusive platforms where uh, different stakeholders can participate in an open dialogue, but also uh, consider all the challenges related to security uh, and uh, to a different kind of um, yeah, espionage and so on. And um, the final one, but probably the most important, how to ensure that civil society in Ukraine physically and mentally uh, is, is physically and mentally alive and also included in the essential processes. As um, Dr. Anke mentioned, yeah, people physically are under threat, so they um, can disappear in, in every moment, being on the front line or in the communities uh, hundreds of kilometers behind the front line. But also the mental space and mental structures are uh, under threat as well, so people need to take care uh, to ensure physical safety of their kids and other dependents. Um, civil society are engaged into humanitarian response. And um, yeah, the burnout after 14 months of um, working and living through the war is something that um, yeah uh, highlights or maybe put, put under, under threat that um, we can lose a 
big percentage of civil society activists, volunteers um, after, after a while. Uh, so how to support them in these conditions? That's uh, also an open question um, for everyone of us here in Ukraine. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Mariana. Um, you talk with such calm about uh, experiences, challenges that, that you're facing yourself as an individual. So you're talking broadly about, about Ukraine and Ukrainians, but it's your, your fortitude and dedication to Ukraine and specifically to Ukrainian civil society inspires all of us. It's, I'm, I'm certain I can say that. Um, thanks for emphasizing the power of civil society. Uh, of self-organization, this Ukrainian spirit. I think of the the soldier flipping off the the Russian ship, you know, this like grit. Um, and yet moving even beyond, you use the word recovery. It sounds like more than recovery when you're talking about increasing gender equality, inclusion of LGBTQ plus, um, a new societal agreement. You know, the first challenge that you listed around vision it sounds to me like there's some elements of that vision already um, in play. The inclusive platforms as well, when you say it needs to be gender inclusive, it means looking at different sexual orientations. And your question about spirit, um, to me, you embody that spirit, Mariana, and your contribution has been has really enriched our, our conference today. I appreciate that. Um, let's just look at we we did have one question from from Ian come in, but I'm, I'm encouraging Ian to bring that into the panel because it was even broader. Um, but let's see if if we have others. Um, let's see, yeah, maybe you could. If there's anything further you wish to share, Mariana, at this time, I know you were making reference to to some of the other presentations that were coming. Um, something that that I'm curious about. Um, is also the international level and how different countries are approaching the Russian war in Ukraine. You know, whether um, that's the United States providing a lot of arms or it's China saying, here's a peace plan. And I know President Xi spoke recently with President uh, Zelensky about, about a, that possible peace plan. Could you talk about that international level briefly? and? How do you see some of these different interventions in your country? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dominic. I think uh, also speaking from the perspective of Ukrainian civil society, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, so for internationals, it's really a challenge to make Ukrainian civil society satisfied with um, with, with what they are uh, doing to respond to the crisis, definitely uh, a lot of appreciation is here to the efforts of United States and European Union to uh, support Ukraine. And that's uh, something that is repeated on all the platforms inside and also outside Ukraine. Um, but also speaking from uh, about other um, international actors who are right now engaging into this mediation process around Ukraine, um, I would say that Ukrainian society is welcoming that there are certain processes happening, but also being very precautious that uh, that that is definitely not an not only a territorial conflict which is going on in Ukraine that is very value focused, and um, definitely we will need to talk with China at some point and also consider what they are offering. And that what that is what, what happened um, in the recent phone call um, of President Zelensky with, the, president, uh, with uh, uh, the leader of China. We didn't have had um, the amb Ukrainian ambassador in China and the embassy was not functioning. So that is a step towards creating certain platform or preconditions to have these conversations. But uh, I guess um, everyone in Ukraine is keeping in mind that China is not fully uh, the partner which we would like to be associated with uh, in terms of values and uh, democratic approaches. So uh, that's why I don't know if I answered the question, but that is this ambiguity that uh, 
yeah, the structures can be helpful with uh, this challenging um, actors in on the international space, uh, but they are not guaranteeing that um, we should uh, consider all the suggestions or we are willing to consider all the suggestions that are being proposed. Thank you very much for that, that response. Um, values, political power, economic power on the global stage are all really in flux right now and, and kind of up for grabs, it feels like. Um, let's thank Mariana for her input uh, so that we can then also move on to the panel. Um, I'm going to invite my colleague Douglas onto the stage to moderate the panel among all the speakers. Douglas, giving the floor over to you, please. Hi, everyone, and thanks for, the, for these inspirational inputs today. Uh, super fascinating, and I really do see some very clear through lines uh, from the mention of, uh, of crisis uh, as a, a, um, a sort of a turning point in, in fostering transformation on a personal level uh, to how we're seeing real world crises um, open up amazing, uh, some terrible things, but some amazing opportunities for, for serious systemic transformation. Um, and and the, the, the different uh, challenges presented by Manuel and, and Dr. Giesen and, and Mariana, I think they, they speak to that, that crisis um, point very much. Uh, for our panel, just to let you know how the panel is, is going to work, um, we're going to first, uh, I'm just going to share my screen quick fast. Um, so for the speaker panel today, um, what we do for the speaker panel is we are going to ask all participants to, to um, sort of think about this question. What are the entrenched challenges that you still see in applying governance and structures for democracy and sustainability transformations? It's a pretty broad question. Join the Slido poll uh, and take um, a minute um, to sort of come up with a statement um, uh, and then take a look around at the other statements. You don't, you're not obligated to write a statement if you don't have one, but check out what is being, uh, is being posited in the Slido area, and then please upvote. And the top upvoted statement, we're going to throw it back to the panel to have the panel discuss that. And so Dominic, whilst you're thinking about this, is going to share the Slido poll, um, uh, live so we can all see what you're generating so please generate a statement if you feel free if you would like to on what are the entrenched challenges you see in a, applying in governance and democracy um uh, governance and structures for democracy and sustainability transformations dominic i'm going to stop sharing and martin if you could put that into the chat that would be great and dominic please share your screen All right, Douglas, we have some answers coming in. So these focused on, on challenges. So let me share what we're seeing so far. And like Douglas said, please go ahead and, and type in other challenges that you're, you're seeing. And then feel free to upvote with the, the thumbs up icon on the right hand side. Thanks, Dominic. Yeah, just take a look in the slide um, that Dominic is showing and whichever rises to the top, we're going to throw that challenge for discussion back to the panel for a few comments. There's plenty of comments now. It's good. Please take a look. There's lots of interesting, lots of interesting suggestions. Got 10 statements right now. Let's have a vote. 
Really good. All right. I think we should call it and let's throw it back. And Bruce, it's your question, your challenge, which seems to be the um, the most popular. So let me throw it to you, Bruce, um, as a challenge, um, leadership capacity. Um, since leadership within networks um, and other novel governance forms is not taught or well understood. Um, Bruce, would you care to expand a little bit on that challenge and how you you see that challenge uh, manifest? Sure. Well, I think I think we all know that the, the contrast between kind of uh, leadership within traditional organizations that might be hierarchical uh, and uh, you know, organized a pr a principles, a, around principles of strong leadership with that kind of, you know, patriarchal masculine quality of sort of uh, having having a vision and implementing it within an organization. Those those models are don't work uh, in networks and communities of practice and civil society. Um, and so there's been a lot of thinking about what soft leadership skills might look like, what network leadership looks like. But I, I don't know if that thinking has been fully, you know, uh, uh, transferred to practice effectively and, and, and is something that people have access to, to learning about and teaching. And of course, CL, this is, this is a red meat for CLI, I'm sure. I mean, given that this is, what uh, your primary mission is, but I've, I've so often seen uh, leaders within networks improvising. You know, they're they're capable, they're enthusiastic, they're entrepreneurs, but they're they're kind of winging it. They're kind of figuring figuring it out from a from a, a baseline of of no knowledge of experience, and it's so frustrating to see people reinventing the wheel in terms of discovering network leadership. Uh, skills and processes along the way and and there doesn't seem to be a lot of ability to share these ideas and, and train a uh, next generation so that they don't have to go through that that mm -hmm. learning process so that's kind of the the feeling that i have about uh leadership within these settings that it's 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 not something that's well institutionalized or well understood or, or well taught and that the capacity is not widely available yeah, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting point. And I'd like to actually pass it over to Manuel because Manuel, I asked him a question in his comment. He actually mentioned that the Chancellor Olaf Scholz is going up to Rugen to have a conversation. I don't want to make any comment on the personal leadership or individual leadership style of the Chancellor. Um, uh, but it, it's it's interesting as well that um, you know, there's a a certain name that's put to the dialogue. So Manuel, let me throw this question to you about uh, sort of leadership styles for transformation. Um, over to you, Manuel, some reflections on that statement by Bruce. Yes, uh, thank you. So, thank you so much for uh, posing this very important challenge and question because I think you're, you're really nailing it there. Um, because I think in the tradi traditional political organizations, maybe parties, maybe like governance structures, or well, even parliament, uh, you have this still this logic or this traditional logic of leadership, you know, with hierarchical structures, someone with a great vision, and um, this contrasts very strongly what I'm seeing um, in in some parts of the civil society, you know, with this network-based leadership, principle-based communities. So, so there's a lot of social innovation going on, um, but traditional political institutions um, have their problems with adaption, oftentimes because the, the institutions are designed in a way uh, to maintain the status quo and maintain power. So logically, everything that goes into the direction of, hey, let's do more collaboration, let's do more uh, participation, um, needs to be, it, it can be taken by with a, with a sort of grain because, um, a grain of salt, uh, because uh, there's always this, well, what is what are the real intentions behind it when somebody is posing it to some citizen participation? Right? It's really about citizen participation or do you want to find some legitimacy for a project that uh, wouldn't be otherwise very popular? I could go on there, but I just want to say uh, thank you so much for for lining that out. 
Yeah, thanks, Manuel. Um, I think the entrenched structure that you're 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 talking about with big bureaucracies is a serious challenge, and the German bureaucracy is is famous uh, for its um, for its effectiveness, but also for some of its rigidity. Um, I'd like to throw this over to to Mariana because Mariana, I think you know when you're describing the way that civil society networks are are, are taking a leading role and um, are really showing off the incredible resilience of Ukraine by their mere existence and networking capacities, their leadership capacities within uh, Ukraine in this crisis situation. I'm interested to hear as well about how this leadership capacity is emerging and being more recognized by by the the, the uh, public sector, the government, in that you know, you've highlighted civil society is really being recognized as a legitimate partner. Um, you know, is that something that we can expect um, will die down as um, as the conflict dies down and crisis dies down? Is that something that we think that you think will really lead to some transformational change in the way of governance in Ukraine? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, what I can observe since uh, like my active participation in the civil society life since uh, 2004, uh, the self-organization is something that is... Uh, emerging and developing uh, in Ukraine. And um, there is uh, maybe some, some tension between um, different approaches to self-organization and leadership here. Uh, so from one side, um, the public sector um, is somehow creating platforms or structures where uh, it invites civil society representatives for all kinds of structured dialogues. Uh, and that's something what uh, Manuel uh, just mentioned. This kind of structures may be effectively used or misused to um, somehow legitimate um, different processes. Uh, but that's not such a huge threat uh, in Ukraine, Ukraine right now, as there is a very huge personal leadership on the ground where people are just doing. So this uh, ability to um, take over the collective action and just start doing, that's something that balances uh, this more traditional uh, approach uh, of public sector. And this uh, like collective action is uh, visible everywhere on a very local level, with these examples that they showed in the pictures, but also on a very high level. For example, um, with uh, the coalition, national coalition that is called Rice Coalition, um, which uh, is a civil society um, government coalition focused on creating digital tools for transparent, accountable um, recovery of Ukraine and uh, spending resources. Uh, also from another side, what... Um, I should underline prob probably that um, there is a certain tension between access to resources. Uh, and what is right now uh, unique in Ukraine is that many processes in Ukraine are uh, relying on crowdfunding and charity and donations from people. And uh, that's why like being able to provide resources for the country um, and do not having any kind of um, monopoly on resources uh, inside the country. It's something that balances this two, um, yeah, two parts of, of, of the issue of the problem. Um, thanks, Mariana. Um, it's always inspirational to hear you reflect on, on what's going on there, your experience and what you're seeing. Uh, and of course, I'm looking forward to having future discussions with you. Um, I'd like to pass over to, to Dr. Giesen as well to think about this question about uh, leadership and, and how the leadership uh, within the sort of <laughs> very dynamic landscape of Memorial and its network, um, how, how that um, how that has has played out um, sort of leadership in a network as well as with structures that have been evaporating, um, as you've described um, in in for many of the the memorial members within uh, Russia, Dr. Kiesen, to you. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I start a bit smiling because our problem is, uh, in principle, um, the toxic leadership um, imagines the imagines of toxic leadership in Russia um, that everything should be. Uh, done by a strong leader and um, 
patriarchic leader and uh, so on. And uh, our aim in Russia is the opposite, that um, people um, don't concentrate always on strong leaders, but they begin to understand that they have their own powers and uh, to to empower them and to to uh, question leadership <laughs> and um, uh, or maybe for this another type of leadership is um, um, we we need another type of leadership um, leaders who uh, are capable are able to empower people and who can who don't identify with uh, images of leadership who who can be um, who leads people um, to to activation and to empowerment and who can step aside i think this is this is very very um, this what we need in russia and in other authoritarian countries thanks Thank you, Dr. Giesen. And for that last comment, you know, I'm just here at Collective Leadership. And once again, then a thanks to Bruce for posing his question about leadership. Uh, definitely, yeah, this is the um, the meat and potatoes of the work that CLI does. I'd like to, to, to end that challenge uh, question now and just go back to the Slido for um, a short uh, focus now on solutions or potential solutions. So once again, I share the screen and the potential solutions, the question general again, potential solutions, what do you see in applying governance and structures for democracy and sustainability transformations? Please type in a statement if you feel the urge, upvote um, what you think is the most relevant, and then we'll throw it back to the panel for very brief comments before we transition over to our final session. So over to the Slido poll, please. And please type in your question or statement about potential solutions for applying governance and structures for democracy and sustainability transformations. And then when things start to appear, please put those thumbs up and let's see what's the most popular. So we throw it back to the panel. See some things are starting to come in. Colonize our minds. I like that one. All right, let's take another couple of seconds just to upvote. We've got seven statements now. Dominic is sharing. I think we should close it and just throw it quickly back to um uh to the to the plenary. We have a a a winner which is decolonize our minds, which is an interesting way to say things. Um but uh, let's just throw that back to the panel and uh, David, um I wouldn't mind starting with you since you didn't get a chance to speak in the last one. Um when we talk about potential solutions to to um uh, introducing uh or or yeah, applying governance and structures for democracy and sustainability transformations. Um, when you think about decolonizing our minds, how do you see that as a potential solution? So, uh, David, I'm throwing that one to you for an answer. <laughs> 
quick one. Well, quick I think one. it's uh, <laughs> a solution that goes uh, a little bit to the root because um, the situations we are in, we have created all, all this in a sense, right? It's not um, something that is happening to us, but uh, it's something that comes from a history of educating people in certain ways, of thinking in certain ways, interacting or relating with each other and with the world, with uh, non-human beings, etc. In, in certain ways. Now we are at the almost hopefully at the end of this process of accumulation, right? And and we are, we have internalized all these things so much, and um, and it's uh, based on control, it's based on hierarchy, based on you know understanding the world as a hostile place. So, so that's what I mean. I would say decolonizing means right to stop. Uh, trying to be on control of things, to embrace uncertainty, to embrace that the fact that we all die and you know we don't know what, when it's going to happen, but uh, it's it's not up to us. Many of the things that happens are not to us. And then start connecting with with nature, with uh, with the planet as a as a as a house, as a as a as a, pl as a welcoming place uh, that we are part of, right? So that's I don't know in a nutshell <laughs> how I see it. David, no, I appreciate the comment, and it definitely, you know, it brings me back to thinking about again the um, the sort of exposition that you talk about to non-Western ways of thinking, and the sort of battle that we have to wage within our minds uh, to expose ourselves to that more unity thinking rather than the Western colonial mindset that dominates or is dominant in our own minds, but also in the minds of many of the people that we work with. So thank you very much for that comment. Let me throw this one over to Don, Dr. Giesen again, um, as sort of to talk about the decolonization of our minds as a potential solution. What do you think of that statement, Dr. Giesen? Uh, I think um, the colonization of our minds could be mean that we always think in hierarchies, that we think that there are people who are better, who are more worth um, than others. And um, so decolonizing of uh, our minds for me means that uh, we deeply, we understand on a very deep level that uh, every human being and not only human beings that that every being on this world um have have the same worth and uh that we we should um act with uh, awareness uh to this um fundamental worth of of every being on this planet and and if we are able to think in this way then then our minds are really decolonized i think yeah, thank you. I'm hearing, uh, you know, this reminds me a little bit of our discussion on Wednesday when Ridley was talking about, you know, global citizenship and education for sustainable development. That was, um, you know, it's a bit, definitely a big part of uh, of that. And I'm certainly hearing a strong sense that, yeah, we, we need to re-educate ourselves um, in, in certain ways to struggle against the fragmented, uh, you know, sort of postmodernist industrial mindset that we all have. Um, yeah, uh, let me throw this one over to Mariana. What does it mean to you, uh, decolonization of our minds as a potential solution? Go. Uh, I will say very briefly, this uh, solution um, for me is very much linked to the uh, second top voted in our poll, more consciousness uh, of the overall situation we live in. Um, so I wouldn't uh, say here some very pathetic or very uh, ambitious things to do, but just like being conscious about uh, ourselves, the position we are in, and also being conscious about others. That would be definitely a huge step that humanity could take. All right. Thanks, Mariana. And a final word from Mr. Rojas on decolonizing our minds um, as a potential solution. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, most things that I want to say uh, have been said already, and I thank you so much for that. Uh, I would, uh, what comes to my mind is uh, our minds are shaped also strongly by institutions, are shaped by structures, and are shaped by governance. So um, my strong call would be 
to always have this in mind, also from a holistic point of view, that we still have nation states, we still have all these institutions that may be problematic for a holistic or global solutions, but they're still in place and, and we won't replace them so, uh, so quickly. So um, if we are able to take this mindset of decoloniz decolonizing our minds into the institutions and walk through these institutions, uh, to promote this mindset and make it part of our everyday action, um, then I think we can uh, be part of a gradual change that is radically needed in our modern current world. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to to Manuel for these final words. Uh, I absolutely agree, and I think the work that 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 CLI does in, out in the world, um, you know, we work always, almost always within within structures. Um, and we don't try and change those structures, but we do try and plant the seeds of change in the minds of the people that we work with. Um, I think that that very much aligns with the way that that we're thinking about doing our work. And I want to thank all the panelists um, for for contributing your thoughts and feelings to to this this um, panel session as well as today. I'm going to pass the floor now uh, or the the spotlight back to my partner and colleague Elizabeth, who's going to to give us a great summary wrap up um, as well as a conceptual input, uh, sort of unifying the entire conference. This last uh, three sessions today, Wednesday, and also Monday. Um, uh, so Elizabeth, I pass it over to you and please stick around for this fascinating wrap up over to you, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you very much, Douglas. And thank you everyone for, for the conversation just now. Um, to be quite honest, I feel slightly daunted from like trying to wrap all of, wrap up all of these uh, fantastic inputs we've literally just had now in this session and also in the other ones. But I'm going to do my best. And um, let me actually start by uh, going back and saying we as the Collective Leadership Institute, we really um, believe that it's important to bring people together both online and offline. And that connects to uh, the topic we also just had about the mindset shift and uh, the different way of seeing the world and also supporting each other in unlearning a lot of structures um, and uh, a lot of mindsets that are around us, but that are actually harmful. And so that is one of our intentions in, in these different ways of yeah, bringing people together who really want to contribute to sustainability transformation. And so we do this online here in this uh, Transformation Literacy Conference every year. Um, but this year we could finally also complement these online sessions with an in-person event. And this took actually place last Friday in Potsdam in Germany. So technically the conference week really kicked off uh, in, in person um, on this event. And we took this occasion to really to celebrate International Earth Day, as well as the launch of the new book by Dr. Petra Künko, our founder and honorary president on transformation stewardship and stewardship as a as a capacity and as a competence for, for building the future. And so to bridge that um, not unsubstantial divide um, between those who were here in Potsdam in Germany in person, um, but also everyone here who is now online, who has been online uh, during this conference week, we have a very brief film uh, that brings together the highlights from the evening. It's really just very short, kind of like a trailer, and shows us how um, this week and this conference week actually started. So I will be sharing my screen and keep your fingers crossed, please, uh, for me that the technology um, agrees with me and everything works. In Wir sind heute hier im Haus der Natur in Potsdam. Wir versuchen da heute wirklich eine Premiere auf die Beine zu stellen. Das heute ist die kiko veranstaltung zur Transformation Literacy Konferenz des Collective Leadership Instituts für dieses Jahr 2023. Diese kickoff veranstaltung ist nach der langen Corona-Zeit tatsächlich das erste Mal, dass wir persönlich mit unseren Partnern zusammenkommen. Wir hatten im letzten Jahr schon eine Online-Konferenz und dieses Jahr kombinieren wir die beiden Sachen 
dieses Kickoff heute und dann in einer Woche die Online-Veranstaltung. Ja, wir erwarten einen bunten, eine bunte Mischung von Gästen. Es werden Leute aus der Zivilgesellschaft da sein. Es werden Leute aus dem öffentlichen Sektor dabei sein. Ein paar Leute von Unternehmen auch oder Unternehmensverbänden. Ja, und wir hoffen einfach, dass es eine tolle Veranstaltung wird, wo eben diese unterschiedlichen Stakeholder zusammenkommen und wir über die Themen diskutieren können. Bei der internationalen Online-Konferenz sieht es so aus, dass wir schon Anmeldungen haben aus über 40 Ländern. Hello everyone, I am greeting you from Cape Town, South Africa. Hi, I'm from New York City, that's where I'm calling in from, as you can see from my romantic background. Wir, das ist das Collective Leadership Institute. Unser Thema ist es, Nachhaltigkeit durch Partnerschaften zu gestalten. Das ist eine gemeinnützige Organisation. Wir sitzen in Potsdam, aber wir haben eine internationale Ausrichtung und auch ein internationales Team, das in der ganzen Welt sitzt. Eine Institution, die international arbeitet und im Zentrum das Thema Dialog und Kooperationskompetenz hat. Hi, I'm calling from Cairo, Egypt. Ich glaube, wir kommen jetzt zu einem weiteren Highlight. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir mit dem Kickoff auch eine Buchpremiere verbinden können. Die Buchpremiere von Dr. Petra Künkels neuem Buch. Ja, das Buch heißt Zukunftskompetenz Stewardship. Und es geht darum, vitale und resiliente Systeme zu entwickeln durch transformative Führung. Und diese Zukunftskompetenz brauchen wir dringend. Wir werden zum ersten Mal als Institut einen Preis verleihen, der Transformative Partnership Award. Der wird im nächsten Jahr verliehen. Es geht darum, anzuerkennen, dass dieses Wir, das immer stattfinden muss, um tatsächlich Nachhaltigkeit zu erreichen, ob es jetzt in der Kommune ist oder in der Region, in einem Land oder äh, zwischen Ländern. Das ist komplex, das ist herausfordernd, das verlangt Energien, das verlangt vor allem unglaublich viel Innovation, Kompetenz, Kreativität, Durchhaltevermögen. Und das wollen wir wertschätzen und honorieren mit diesem Preis. Und das kam sehr gut an, viel Resonanz. Die ersten Leute wollen sich auch schon bewerben. Ähm, ja, und er ist offen international. Auf unserer Webseite findet ihr die Infos. Und wir freuen uns auf eure Bewerbung. Themen, die sind einfach relevant, das haben wir heute gespürt und die werden jetzt im Online-Raum weiter diskutiert mit unseren internationalen Experten. Das wird eine regelmäßige Sache, das ist zumindest der Plan. Das heißt, wir freuen uns schon nächstes Jahr 2024 auch wieder im Rahmen des internationalen Earth Day die Konferenz zusammenzubringen, eine globale Konferenz und hier in Potsdam, wo wir sitzen, tatsächlich den Kickoff zu haben für diese jährliche Veranstaltung. Just need to find the mute button. <laughs> yes, so uh, that was just a little impression from the kickoff uh, that we had uh, last Friday for the conference with where where our journey really started. And so I want to bring just a few highlights from the sessions that we've had throughout the week uh, together. And emphasis is really on a few <laughs> because the conversations are really very rich the inputs were rich the, the panel conversations so um but just to see a little bit what what this journey on insights and some of the highlights that were there um were were brought here was we started off with the session on narratives and metrics very first one um on last monday actually and we had an input from uh Uh, by uh, Maria Amalia, who actually mentioned and uh, highlighted how important it is to have balanced feedback loops that really strengthen community in responding to needs and in showing the impact uh, of contributions and interconnections that we do in our work. We had Doreen Simuyo, who really highlighted how important it is to make information and data truly accessible and truly understandable and provide communities with resources and tools to do so. My colleague Carol Mutiso, she also mentioned how important it is to have combine inclusive processes for developing narratives and governance structures in initiatives. 
So have this really as a parallel process, especially when the work that you're doing is really complex. And finally, Gwendolyn Van Zandt, she really highlighted how different education approaches for repairing societal narratives of oppression are really key. You cannot just focus on one, you need to use a diversity here. And so in the panel conversations, we had a key challenge emerging um, around the question, how to really ensure donor flexibility to work with emerging needs. And the documentation will uh, also show, I think Amalia was very uh, expansive on this as well, but it continues to be one of the shifts that we actually need to do um, because there's still a lot of work to do there. But also a key solution that emerged here was promoting capacity building for really genuine community-led development. And so bringing this back to the transformation enablers around enlivening narratives and empowering metrics for transformation, it really shows a threat here in the session that data needs to be understandable. It needs to show progress and the change in needs. And we need to make sure that we co-create value and values that inform both our metrics, how we measure going forward, and also the narratives that bring us together here. And our second session from narratives and metrics, which happened on Wednesday then, was innovation and regulation. And here we were joined by Rili Lappalainen, who among others, I feel made this memorable statement of saying, we really need to pilot uncomfortable partnerships. So highlighting the element of discomfort and courage that is also part of innovation. And Yvonne Vaguero also joined this and said, we don't need to, we don't only need to co-create and, and innovate what we are doing, but also how we're doing things. So co-creation also requires innovative approaches to how we engage the different and diverse kind of people and stakeholders that we need. And Aaron complimented the panel here, Aaron and Katasan, he said, among other many notable things, he really said, we need to shift this focus from the I to the we, and notably here, really create value and deliver value to a broader ecosystem. So think about value creation and um, connecting to the interests of a larger group of stakeholders that you have around an initiative, even if it's a small one, but especially if it's a large one. And so our panel conversations here were really focused on the key challenge. How do you engage stakeholders, especially the public, um, when there is an over a feeling of um, over, being overwhelmed a lot of times in society? So how do you encourage interest here? And from that conversation, I think as well, there was a key solution that then also emerged from um, the inputs and the, the, the poll results from participants saying, here as well, we need to connect to this element of saying we need to teach humility and cooperation and collectivism as really better paradigms than competition. So here as well, there's a thread around paradigm shifts that we need to make on an individual and collective level. And bringing this back to the strategic elements, innovation and regulation for transformation, we see that these inputs and conversations really showed creative spaces as part of innovation. They need to nurture also our courage to jump into new things, and we need to innovate the how, not just the what, and create really value for a large system as possible around new ways of doing things and what we're doing. And so finally today, I really just uh, grabbed a couple of things from this very rich conversation that we had today with Bruce Goldstein, who among other things said, we really need uh, for, for transformation practitioners, they really highlight that we need a systems approach to diagnose, we need to co-develop knowledge, and we need to focus on collective action. This is actually transformation practice uh, that emerges what we're doing if we really want to bring this forward. And David, uh, you complemented this also by saying that there's a major challenge that is really emerging as a trend. We have this institutional rigidity and a lack of transformative mindsets, a lack of funding, lack of resources as well, that really 
um, is a larger pattern here in, in the difficulties that we're dealing with. And so, um, Manuel, uh, your input also focused uh, very strongly on the challenge of how do we do this integrating local dialogue that often is really is truly important um, with the political with the time pressure on political decisions that we're often faced with. So these are two very fundamental realities where value conviction and also the need for consultation really clashes with. Well, if you are under time pressure and you need to find a solution, how do you do this? And I think what Dr. Anke Giesen had said also, among uh, many other things, is highlights from memorial works really say we need to, you need to focus on continuing the work, switch to alternative structures if it's possible, and really engage in this trans transformation also of organization and innovate wherever possible. And finally, Mariana, I think uh, you also highlighted the really key role that civil society plays, right? I think we all know in emergency situation, civil society shows up. But you also showed that this really builds engagement for longer term transformations like decentralized structures, more decision making input also from local, from local elements, from local structures, and also shifting towards more long-term topics like the green, you know, rebuilding uh, Ukraine um, differently with a green approach. That also comes from civil society. And I think that's a factor that shouldn't be underestimated when we look at civil society as a governance, um, as, as governance and a structure um, role player. And so the panel conversations, I'm just repeating, I think what is just present on our mind, um, where the key challenges around leadership capacity and also colonizing our minds. So both of these elements, I think, really recognize that um, in the transformation efforts that we face, it's the collective that is needed. It's the collective also that shifts things. But the collective is made up of, of individual people and we have a lot of um, rethinking, uh, relearning to do. And while that happens on an individual level, we also need the collective support to really um, take out the hierarchies that structure so much of our thinking and doing, uh, I think, as Anke, as Anke nicely said. And so today, I think this emergence of, let's say, concrete collective action in learning and doing things as a key point for enabling structures, whether it's formal or informal, like civil society nets, networks, really emerged very strongly in the session here today. And so from this, just a couple of highlights from these very rich conversations um, and discussions that we've heard. I also want to highlight another thing that actually crossed our different sessions. You know, you see, we had these framing around particular enablers. Um, and, but at the same time, these kind of connections also cross our sessions. So very concretely, when we started off with, um, with this learning journey around strategic elements of transformation on narratives and on metrics, Gwendolyn in particular, I remember, um, really had a very strong input on, on education. And the key solution that emerged here from this session was saying, we need to promote capacity building for really genuine community-led development. So capacity building emerged quite strongly as a, red, as a thread here, which again actually connects us to the transformation enablers of innovation and regulation, because education is a key element, not only in accessing, but also understanding information. I remember really nicely said, you know, we need a human being language. We need to have information that is understandable with common sense. And the connection to regulation is crucial since regulation allow or promote resources and attention going to this kind of education as a lever for change, which is why it's so worrying that, especially in the last couple of years, so much resources and financial focus has been going away from education. And in this session that we've had, innovation regulation. 
A key challenge that was upvoted here was on engagement. How do we deal with often overwhelmed stakeholders and society in general? And so this connects us back to today's session, structures and governance. Um, remember, David, you mentioned the challenge of institutional rigidities. No extra resources in time or money assigned to transformation. So this connects us to regulation. We have we had the brief conversation. We need incentives for transformation. We need time and uh, extra money for all of this. This connects us also to metrics. We've had Anka's input who said, it's so important to have a really high commitment to shared goals to continue when you know, legal structures around you basically break down or when your organization gets oppressed. And that connects us back also to narratives. So these are just some highlights of how the different sessions are actually interconnected amongst each other. And I think that is for maybe reflecting going forward also about what you take away from this conference um, and what your key insights are, is that of course it is more than ever, it is really important to remember that all of these enablers are of course connected. Everything is, everything is connected. Um, especially if we look at transformation, this really highlights our need to have this systems view. Because these transformation enablers, they're derived from very practical experience, like the one that we've seen this entire week uh, during this conference. But they're also embedded in a very systemic understanding of the world, recognizing this interconnection. And so any effort for transformation that we do is with people. And we are living beings interacting in this brilliant living ecosystem that is our planet. And we need to bring this systems thinking into practice. And that is where we all as individuals are also needed. So again, I'm connecting very strongly also to, I think the, the, the final conversations we've had just today, we really need to support each other in changing our individual mindsets but also having the ability to then um, to, to really enact a system to you. Right, everybody says this now, but how do we do this? How? And so behind these transformation enablers, there's also a pattern of capacities um, that really support uh, all the action, all the thinking, the unlearning, the shifting of our minds, the shifting of a paradigm from you know very hierarchical leadership and very hierarchical ways of doing things to a much more collective one. And so skills like skills for innovation, skills for humility, for cooperation, skills for really good collect like making it bringing collective intelligence also to the forefront, thinking in future possibilities. This is what is these are the skills behind here. And um, I'm just picking up, I remember that, uh, was it Arun said this paradigm shift from the I to the we, the capacities to design and facilitate processes that promote emergence, that promote innovation, and generally understand how our different actions promote and connect to these transformation enablers that we need to have. This is what is behind um, also the uh, certification program that we have along the skills that I've briefly shown here on the slide, which is the collective leadership compass. And so this supports um, systems thinking, supports process skills, supports also um, the personal shift and the personal decolonizing of mind that we need to do in order to really emerge and, and shift towards a different way of doing and thinking things, whether we are in an official leadership position or whether we are very much a leader on the civil, civil society and an informal level. So I think my uh, colleague Martin posted some more on information on this in the chat. So if you're interested in that, um, please have a look. We have some more free, uh, free information session also on this that just shows how you know these large conversations and large topics, how this connects back to our skill building um, and to our capacity building, really. And so, 
at this point in time, <laughs> I think what is what is a really important question that we really want to ask you um, to bring slowly this uh, wrap up also uh, to a close is to think about from whether you attended just today's session or several sessions uh, in this conference, actually, um, to think about what your idea is for a concrete practice or an action that you can apply to drive transformative change. Just some insight, something that you took away here today, or be it uh, at one of the uh, of the other days where you joined us during the conference. And this is our final Slido poll. So again, um, please go to the link that is posted in the chat or uh, use the QR code that is displayed on the screen here and just enter what, you know, first thing that comes to mind, few words, and we just collect a couple of insights from what hopefully you took away as something very practical and concrete that you can do. And as my colleague does this before, I'm also relying on Dominic, uh, who I think is managing the, the slider poll in the background. So whenever um, first responses emerge, um, I would ask you also to share the screen. And then we can have a look, you know, what, what ideas have been collected. And same as before, if you feel there are things that are really inspirational and you say like, yes, this is actually something that I also want to do. I find that a great idea. Please upvote um, any action idea that uh, that you feel. This is no? a word cloud. A word oh, cloud. Okay, then not. <laughs> then feel free if you find something really inspiring. Then write it also in the chat. We don't want this to get lost. Um, I think for now we're just sort of collecting uh, um, collecting the ideas together. But of course, put also in the chat if you say like, yeah, this really speaks to me. This is something that I also want to and can do. All right, thank you, Dominic. And I see we have first couple of answers here. So express com express compassion to someone. We have a reminder of the power of peer exchange, investing in citizen-led processes, the importance to taking care of your own health. Yeah, we have a couple of other things, building capacity. Changing thinking and doing it. Right. Again, contributing to capacity building. Remember that crises also create transformation. Yes. Have a live communication systems. Heartlet change practicing. Wonderful. The reminder to be kind. Looks like we have still okay. about 10 or 11 people filling out the poll, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's just give it a moment for everybody to write their ideas down. Promoting the IDGs, SDGs. Transformation support network, yes. See lots of different things emerging there, yeah. Institutional creativity. Great, there's so much I think that connects to so many different different elements that we that we discussed like the element of humility um but also the the structural element for innovation for creativity for learning in peer exchange for education everything around capacity uh capacity building and change in thinking and also doing it I see also in the chat, inner development goals. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, promote the inner development goals. Yes. I think that's also very important, you know, on a global level, sort of the recognition between 
the individual change that needs to happen together with the large systemic and structural and collective change that needs to take place if we really want to achieve the SDGs. I think we're complete with the responses. Yeah, okay, looks good. Great, thank you for, thank you for sharing this. And I just want to, um, I think I want to just highlight with this very last poll that we did, quite honestly, um, that, you know, humanity as such, we as individual persons, but us taking together also, humanity is really extraordinary because as Manuel said, you know, we have the created, we have created the way the world is, we have done this. So we have created this um, this era, really, of the uh, Anthropocene, meaning this age in where we as living beings represent the most important factor influencing the ecosystem that is planet Earth. And I think it is extremely important to keep reminding each other and remember that we can also harvest our extraordinary capacities to advance the many transformations that are needed together in partnership approaches, in collaborations that also take a stand and contribute to democracy and good governance. And I think now more than ever. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague Davis for some last but very important announcements. Okay, thanks Elizabeth for this. For this wrap up and summary, I mean, it was an incredibly rich conference um, and it, it just, you know, scratching the surface with, you know, a little over six hours of, of presentation discussion time. Um, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot underneath it. And I really do want to, um, to commend, to commend us all, both participants and also organizers for, um, for setting up this forum to have these really important conversations at this a uh, very, very vital juncture in human history. Um, I just want to share a few things before we we sign off for for the end of the conference. Um, so allow me to share my screen once again. So as uh, you may have seen in the film, uh, the Collective Leadership Institute it has launched the Transformative Partnership Award. Uh, this um, award is going, the prizes are going to be financial contributions to a partnership initiative or places in our certification program. Applications are open. If you want to learn some more, click on the, the, the QR code or check out this website, Collective Leadership um, DE uh, Partnership Award. You'll find it easily. Um, yeah, this is something which is, is really important to CLI that uh, we want to, to really have a focus and a spotlight on on excellent partnership projects uh, that are really driving transformative change through a multi-stakeholder approach and contributing to the achievement of the SDGs. So if you are a part of such a, an initiative, feel free to nominate yourselves, or if you feel like there is an initiative or a partnership that, that you know of that you think could benefit from, from such um, uh, prizes um, or participation in this award, please let them know about it. We would appreciate it very much. Um, uh, also, oops, just so you know that uh, Martin Fielko, my other partner um, and co-executive director who leads our educational programs and marketing, is having an information session to learn more about collective leadership tools and courses for transformative collaboration. If you want to really learn how CLI practices transformative change, we are already in the practice. Um, so we're doing it. Also, um, learning as we go, um, as this is a very new practice. Um, and if you uh, have the time and inclination, next, um, uh, let's see, in a couple of weeks, so not next week, but the week after on the 11th of May at 10 o'clock at CET, which is uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, New York City time, but fine for European and Asians and Africans. Um, please join this uh, this session. You can register here um, with this code or on the website. And finally, I want to thank everybody for joining us um, today, but also this last week. Major, major thanks to the CLI team for putting this together. For the partners, my partners, um, um, Elizabeth Kuhn, Martin Fielko, and Dominic Stucker. Um, thanks so much as well to Katrin Schultz, who did a tremendous amount of heavy lifting in the background. Also, thank you very much for our speakers.
uh, today who are still with us. Sadly, David had to leave us for another meeting and Mariana had an air raid in Kiev, and so she had to sign off. So uh, send her good energy, prayers, whatever you like uh, to, to Kiev. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Giesen, um, um, to um, Bruce. Thank you so much for being with us and starting our, our, our um, relationship uh, in this way. Um, and also thank you, Manuel. It's great to have you um, sort of back with us after, after so long. Um, if you are interested in, in seeing the, the scope of the information, you can find everything on our website uh, under Transformation Literacy. Um, check out the Specialist Certification Program if you're interested in, in really learning transformation literacy and transformative change skills. And please feel free to stay in touch with us. You can send us an email at germany at collectiveleadership.com. Find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter.